In this episode of Open at Microsoft, I have Jerry with me to talk about Graph and Dab. Stay tuned. Hey, Jerry, very happy to have you for the third time uh, on this show. So we already spoke about Data API Builder to scaffold a REST API. We saw how it was easy to deploy in the Azure Static Web App. What do you have for us today? Well, one of the things that Dab does great is it takes your database, like MySQL, Postgres, Cosmos DB, and uh, of course, Microsoft SQL. And we expose it as a REST endpoint, but we also expose it as a graph endpoint. And today, I just wanted to walk you through, I don't know if you've ever seen GraphQL. Uh, a lot of people kind of um, accidentally associate it with the Microsoft graph, which is the great way to you know go through everything in Microsoft 365. We call it a graph, but that's not GraphQL. GraphQL is the language to be able to interact with your data. A little bit like, well, it's a little bit like nothing you've ever seen before. It was invented a long time ago by Facebook, and it's just one of the coolest things. And if you try to enter, uh, try to create your own, man, there is a lot of work to build your own graph endpoint. But that's the beauty of Dab. Dab creates it right there for you. I mean, it's it's enough work to create a REST endpoint, and to know that Dab creates all of those for you. It's another to know that you also, for free, get GraphQL. So uh, as a reminder, Data API Builder is completely open source. This is the repository where we are, and uh, we welcome contributions. So we have a thriving community already with a lot of a lot of developers engaged. So I welcome you to come put a walk through some of the pull requests, look through the code, uh, contribute as much as you want. We, uh, we definitely welcome that. So uh, there I, I you did. Go. Uh, make a, a comment or something like that, and the response was pretty quick. I think the next day I had like some comments, and the fix was already in the the pipeline to be released. Yeah, and I saw your PR that you submitted with all the white space added. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Just um, but nonetheless, I mean, Dab is the, one of the coolest things. So it runs in a container, so it means you can deploy it anywhere. It's not a Windows thing. It's not. It's totally cross-platform. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, it's written in .NET, but of course, who cares what your API is written in? You just want to interact with the endpoints, but it's cool to know. And to implement uh, the graph functionality, we use hot chocolate. And so it's got the best of the best all the way through. And so it's really beautiful. However, all that being said, I want to show you what it's like to, to use a graph endpoint. And I want to start with a database. So I have a simple uh, diagram here of, uh, let me pull it up here, there you go. Of uh, Just really simple, this is my Star Trek database. It has all of the characters and all of the series and it has what species those characters are as well. So nothing really terrific as far as like the most complicated schema of all time, but it 100%. is beautiful because it's so simple, right? And yeah. It has these many-to-many -many relationships because a character can be more than one species and a species can have many characters that represent it as well. So to be able to show all of that inside and, and, and think about how difficult that would be with REST. So if you just had just something very simple like category and item and you were calling a REST endpoint, you could call the category endpoint, get the list, and then loop through each of the categories. And for each one, you would call the item endpoint and get the items for that category. If you had five categories, let's say, that's at least one call to get all the categories and then five more calls to get each of the items for each. So that's potentially six. Now, you can do it, you can change your REST API to be very specific for your use case to make it so you could just use one, but if you have a generic REST API kind of scheme, then that's what it is, six calls to get the data you need for a single screen on yep. your UI. That's what is trying to be solved by uh, a GraphQL where I can say, here's basically all of the items I need in a single query, bring them all to me and let it be dynamic. And so it's really, really beautiful. Oh. So let's just start, if if I'm running uh, DAB here, so Data API Builder, so if I'm running uh, Data API, I automatically get uh, a Swagger endpoint, which is how I interact with all of the, the rest endpoints, but I also get a banana cake pop endpoint as well. Now, these are only, that's what it's called, right? That's the swagger for GraphQL. I, I didn't know. <laughs> it's adorable. It. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. adorable. It, but it's also awesome. Like all of the things that you can do really are kind of magical. And so let me show you in this first box is where you construct the query. So it's different. You don't start by, I only want the items. You don't start by, you start by creating the query. And from the query, 
you say what you want inside it. And so it has autocomplete as well to help you out. And so I'll, I'll start with the series. So uh, here's the just the series. And everything is kind of a JSON format, even though it's not JSON behind okay. the scenes. And, well, uh, can so, I just stop you? Because you say there's like a completion. Is it about like the like the JSON or about the, the schema? Because it oh, knows. So your... glad you asked. A hundred percent right. So when I say dab start and and dab starts for the very first time, the way that I make dab work in the first place is just a single configuration file into the JSON file that describes the tables that I want. But if I want graph, and so let me, in fact, let me show you what my configuration file, why it's special. So I have in my entities, right? This is the entire, um, this is the entire configuration file, right? So I have some runtime information that enables graph. I don't have to have it if I don't want it. Enables rest. Again, I don't have to have it if I don't want it. And a couple of other things, right? Including my connection string. But then I go into my entities and the things that I want. So in the rest world, when I say, I want an actor, that's an actor endpoint where I get all the actors from it and I can filter and I can sort and things like that too. Yeah. But when it comes to the graph world, it's a little bit different. Now I can go down and I can add, let me see if I can find one right here. So this, I, I'm passed up uh, actor, I'm, now I'm in the character entity just so you can see. But I can add a relationship and I can create a relationship. So in this case, a character is in a series. And so now this is the name of the relationship of the series. And I can see it's a many to many relationship that allows me to go in, identify which one I'm attaching to, which entity I'm attaching to inside the same configuration file, and then which files are the connections. So remember, for many to many, it's not a primary key foreign key relationship. There's an in between table that allows you to have that many to many relationship in a yeah. database. And so if I were to jump back real quick to let me go to the, there we go, right? So a character and a species, in order to get the characters, I have to have this cross-reference table of character species, just like I have to have an actor has a to a series, yeah. right? So uh, let me jump, here we go. So now that I've had that ident uh, relationship configured in the, in the JSON file, when I start dab, it reads that JSON file and automatically creates the schema that is specific to graph. Oh, so lovely. Okay. That that's the way graph works. And so you get this extra couple of milliseconds in the startup time, but as a result, it's gone and interrogated your actual database and created all of the relationships for you and presented a schema. So if I went over here to schema reference, I can see all the different pieces that oh, there are exposed. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's so cool. there, like here's the character, here's the series. But when I go into the operation, I can create a query. And the autocomplete is coming from this schema reference that's exposed by Data that's API it. Builder. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So now, so there's two ways of of using um, there's two ways of using graph, just like there are two ways of using REST. One is to get data, and another one is to send or update or create data. I'll talk about that in just a second. Let's start with just getting data. So I create this query, and inside the query, it's the item that I want. And so the reason it knows series is because that's part of the schema, right? And I've I've represented that in the configuration file as the series table, but that, that makes it easier for me. So if I didn't want it to be called series, if I wanted it to be called TV series, I could rename it and give it some easy name that I like the most. So now that I'm returning back, now if I run this, by the way, I'm gonna get an error because I haven't asked for any columns. So it's different than rest. Rest, I say, give me the series and it gives me everything. So if a series, for example, has a thousand columns, I get all 1000 columns, which makes the payload of a rest call pretty large and difficult to influence. That's not the way it works with graph. I can say exactly what columns I want to project here and it's as small as I want it to be. So if I only need a single column, that's all I get, and it makes the payload nice and tiny, and it makes your app nice and fast as a result as well. So it that that's in items is how you uh, determine what the columns are that you're going to return. Mm -hmm. And so I'll get the name. Uh, I believe it is plural. Yes. Right. Then I'll get the name. So now when I run it, it returns a list of all of the Star Trek series, all the classic Star Trek series, we'll say. And um, so. We could start with that. I, by the way, I could add a second. I could say what the ID is, and then when I run it, I'll get both the ID and the name. And this is kind of where it begins because I can start to nest things together because of the relationships I've defined. And I can say, okay, now I know that I have uh, the items from a series. Now I don't want the items. Instead, what I want is, um, wait, why didn't the series? 
here it is, yes. Now I, inside items, that, I was in the wrong section. Uh, here is the characters of that series. So now I want it, and I don't have to do, do the join. I don't have to make sure that the relationships are correct. That's all defined for me behind the scenes, making it so the query that I write in graph is as simple as possible. And so now the syntax is exactly the same as if I was interacting with series here. Now, instead though, I'm interacting with character. So I'll get items for it as well. And I'll mm -hmm. ask for the names in items. So name. All right, so this should return a list of all of the series and then all of the characters inside that. So let me run that and I'll show you. So here you go. Number uh, number one is James is well, it's Star Trek. And then James Kirk, there's Spock, there's Leonard, there, all the ones you would expect. And if I needed, say, for example, the star date that they were born on, because this is very valuable information, I just go ahead and get it. So the nice thing is it you don't have to tell me in advance because I'll optimize my REST API and you'll tell me in advance what your UI looks like. Oh, well, I'm going to show first all the series and I'm going to show all the characters. And I'm like, okay, I'll create a REST endpoint that returns exactly the data you need. But look how I can do that right here. And then let's say your UX designer comes in and says, you know what we really need to do is now show what species they are. And so if you're going to show what species they are, I'm going to have to update my REST endpoint to be optimized for that new UI. But instead, I can just go here and I can say species. There we go, species. And I can say items are for it or the columns. And I can say what the name is. So now when I run it, it shows that James Kirk is human and it shows that Spock is both human and Vulcan. And so regardless of how my API is built, it can it's constantly dynamic and allows me to kind of change what I need to do to tailor my um, to ta tailor my payload for whatever UI I have. So it's kind of in the past when you would de design an application, you would have to do a lot of UI work up front to make it so that you could have an optimized API layer. Now it's the opposite. Now I can use graph and I can interact with my data in this constantly dynamic way. And on the back end, it's doing a whole bunch of work for me and there's resolvers and all kinds of things that make it so I pull from the right table, but I don't need to know that. All I need to do is construct a query like this and interact with it. So it's really, really great. There are tons of really terrific pre-built libraries out there to interact with graph endpoints because it can be kind of tricky to build your own query like this. Um, so you don't have to do it from scratch. That's not true, again, with REST. So REST, when I'm interacting with a REST endpoint, more often than not, I'm just calling HTTP client.get and I'm passing in whatever it is I want from there. It's not really a wrapper client. I could write my wrapper client, but there's not really a wrapper client to make it easy. That's not the way it is with GraphQL because GraphQL is so dynamic and interactive like this. All I need to do is point it to a schema and after I've pointed it to a schema, I have a dedicated client that gives me all of the strong typing I would expect in .NET or just the easy interaction I would want in like Python or JavaScript. Now, if you were to build your own, this is the, this is the deal, Frank. If you were to build your own, every time you had this nested thing, you would need to build a resolver on the other end to be able to say this table joins yeah. in this way. So I only want to get these sorts of things. That's pretty nice because if you're only going from you know top level to next to child to grandchild, you could build the resolver. And as much work as it is, if you're paid by the hour, it's going to be okay. But the thing is, once you have these relationships identified, the even reverse um, relationships where I want to go, instead I want to go from the series to the character, I want to go from instead the character back to the series and do reverse. All of that is built into DAB so you get it as long as you've defined it in the config file, right? Very straightforward, no resolver needed, no, all this back end work is there. And so we've just inter introduced a couple of new features in fact, because now we're at dot 10. So we're still in public preview, will be released to um, GA, in March is what we're on track for right now. Okay. Yeah. And so every time we get these little dot releases, we keep adding all these features because we're like, we got to get these in before GA because it's going to be spectacular. And so uh, we've got a couple of new ones. One of them is multiple data sources. So now I can, I can provide not only one connection string, but several connection strings. And as I'm inside my uh, graph query here, I could say I want the series and then I want the character and then I want the species. And the series could be from one location, uh, one database source, uh, and the character could be from another, and the species could be from another. And so we don't join across 
disparate data sources like that. But we do allow you to have in a single query, I can call to Cosmos DB and get my unstructured data. I could call to SQL, get my structured data. And then I could call to my on-prem database and get some sort of internal data as well, all inside a single query that comes back as a single block. Well, payload we'll have to, to uh, have you back to show us like a demo. Frank, of that. it's unbelievable. And, uh, <laughs> but, and, but it's just one of those things that we can enable with a graph query because graph just, it's like however you want to define it is how it's going to work. And we just spin it up. And it's crazy to me how it takes just a couple of milliseconds, it seems, and Dab is suddenly just up and running and you have all of these pieces, all the developer tools you need, caching and security is built in, of course, we would never skip those pieces. And so Amazing. it's really cool stuff, Frank. So we'll make sure to put, provide all the links in the description for people to get started with uh, the Data API Builder or Dab. Uh, and thank you again, Jerry, for being with us, sharing that beauty of DAB, and we'll make sure to invite you again on the show to talk about this cross database, not a source <laughs> story. I love it. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it.